This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and so much to cover yet again over the last week. The speed of work at Boca Chica gets more astounding each week with Starship Serial Number 6 having had its pressure test and Raptor installation. We have a static fire test coming potentially over the next few days, and the breaking news is that we could be seeing Starship SN6 fly within a week. So a lot more detail on these updates here. Another beautiful launch of Starlink during the week with some newly broken records for SpaceX on that mission. Ariane Space recently completed another successful launch of the Ariane 5 heavy lift vehicle. Really cool detail about that MEV2 payload that we'll talk about as well. And on top of that, we have another Falcon 9 launch potentially next week with the Sayocom 1B mission. Following the successful test of Starship SN5 during its 150 metre hop just two weeks ago, the next Starship SN6 is preparing to complete many of the same tests. First, SN6 is required to pass numerous milestones ahead of its own hop. The first of many milestones was a cryo test, which occurred Sunday, the 15th of August. During the test, both the oxygen and methane tanks are filled with liquid nitrogen and then pressurised to somewhere around 7.5 bar if we assume similar pressure tests that played out back with Starship Serial number 4. After this test, the backup closure dates for the 17th and 18th were cancelled, pointing towards a successful test. It was then proven the next day that all went well with the test as the hydraulic rams were removed, making way for Raptor SN29 to be installed underneath just days after. A static fire test is now predicted to occur no earlier than August 23rd, between 8am and 8pm according to the newly released Cameron County road closures. Backup dates are also available on the 24th and 25th. If this significant milestone is a success, the team can then proceed towards SN6's first hop, potentially 150 metres in altitude, or perhaps even a little higher, we hope. The breaking news, of course, is that road closures for August 28th, just a week away, include a potential flight which is amazingly fast. Interestingly, we haven't seen a mass simulator, which we would normally have seen by now, and also no mention of the altitude for the test, so all very mysterious. So yes, hopefully we'll very soon see that successful hop this time with SN6. It's speculated that SN7.1 will then take a trip to the launch pad for its own tests. Now Starship Serial number 7.1 is a test tank that will be more like SN2 than SN7 was. This is because SN7 was just two forward domes welded together, while SN7.1 will have both forward and aft domes like SN2. SN7.1 is not only being built to test the aft dome made of the new 304L alloy, but also a new thrust puck design. This new design now has the liquid methane outlets directly on the puck, along with the liquid oxygen outlets. Now, previous thrust puck designs, of course, had liquid methane outlets cut into the dome itself, and Elon had expressed his discontent with this design, mentioning it needed up to four layers of reinforcement in some areas. The data that should be gained from SN1's test will prove that Starship SN8's pressure levels should be able to hold before bursting. Speaking of the SN8, at the build site, it's already begun final assembly inside the mid bay with the common dome stack and a section of the liquid oxygen tank already stacked. SN8's aft section was also sleeved and flipped. Now the exciting thing about SN8 is that this is expected to gain those flight control fins. Not only has a pair of fore and aft fins been seen on site, but also during the flip we see evidence of mount points on each side of the stack where a few interesting holes could be seen here. Could these holes be to mount the fin actuators to? It looks to be around the correct height for them. Let me know what you think in the comments. On Wednesday night, the same aft dome section was mated to the skirt, and on Thursday, the forward dome was mated to the common dome. As seen in Brendan's latest diagram, there are now only four sections left plus fins until we have a full 20 kilometer worthy Starship ready for the September annual Starship presentation. Now, while SN8 presses on to become the first full stack Starship, SN9 has been been spotted for the first time with a common dome section rolled out of one of the big tents in the production site and then sleeved with a three ring stack shortly after. Then on Thursday, SN9's forward dome was rolled out ready for sleeving with another stack of three rings there. Before we knew it, a truckload of critical hardware arrived early in the week that could possibly be destined for this SN9 or perhaps even a future Starship prototype. This hardware included a thrust puck, downcomer, and a set of six legs. These pieces were produced off-site at either SpaceX's Hawthorne or Florida site and are some of the classiest pieces of hardware we've seen to date with perfect looking welds. After the months it took to get Starship airborne, seeing this level of improvement
improvement and speed by the SpaceX team is extremely encouraging. It is onwards and upwards from here until the 20 kilometer flight in the coming months. Huge thanks as always to the amazing Mary giving so wonderfully of her time with NASA spaceflight, RGV aerial photography as well capturing those wonderful shots from above every week. This here is quite literally the latest footage from Thursday the 20th of August. The detail in this is amazing too. We've just spotted another set of fins here which were delivered throughout the week. The stacking of SN8 there in the mid bay along with the massive high bay construction. This is all made possible by all of you that have assisted with the Patreon there. It's an amazing collaborative effort to fund this so thank you. Also I've just got to share some content from the week by the two amazing 3D artists that are now here in our quality control team. Just check out this beautiful animation from Corey here. With more and more of the hardware showing up at the construction site, SN8's 20 km hop and belly flop are feeling a little more real and Corey has put together one of the best simulations to date showing how the full skydiver flip could occur with future vessels that have the aerodynamic surfaces such as what we believe SN8 and SN9 will have. Now Neopork here is creating the most detailed and beautiful models of the Starship prototypes that I've come across. The attention and work being done here with the detailed hand painted texturing brings it all to life. And just check out some of the brand new cutaway views that are being worked on right now. All that detail along with the new inside structures just gets more impressive every week. Please do check out all of these incredible contributors to Starship content from the description and follow and support any of them where you can. Now some big news this week on SpaceX's Raptor engine with Elon Musk revealing that SpaceX crushed the world record of combustion chamber pressure during a recent Raptor engine test. He released a photo of the Raptor engine during its test on the vertical test stand at McGregor, Texas. Alongside this picture was the corresponding graph showing the Raptor's chamber pressure over time. This Raptor briefly reached a combustion chamber pressure of around 330 bar or almost 4,800 pounds per square inch if that is more relatable to you. This pressure is around 160 times that of an average car tire which is just crazy stuff. The Raptor then shut off and remained intact after the successful and record breaking burn. Now if SpaceX's Raptor engine can sustain a chamber pressure of 330 bar throughout a full duration burn without any damage then the super heavy booster would already have a maximum thrust increase by about 10%. With any added performance the new options could be opened up in the future. Perhaps the number of engines on the super heavy booster can decrease or maybe the size of the booster itself could increase to support a little extra payload capability. Of course it could all just mean that the 330 bar test was just checking out a 10% safety margin. Now on top of this incredible achievement from the Raptor engine development we also got another interesting snippet of information from Elon saying that the Raptor serial number 40 is just about to be tested and has several upgrades over that 330 bar engine. He added there also that the 330 bar on Raptor produces around 225 tons or half a million pounds of force. The development of those Raptor engines is really increasing now so this is very exciting. Now if you want to know more about the Raptor engine I talk quite a bit about that in this video. While you're here of course please do consider subscribing and taking a quick second to tap that like button. Your support has just been incredible. Aiming for 200,000 subscribers by my birthday in October that seemed a stupid goal at one point this year but your support continues to blow my mind every week so who knows. Now earlier in the week SpaceX successfully launched its 11th Starlink mission with 58 Starlink satellites on board accompanied by Skysat 19, 20 and 21 in another great rideshare mission. Now this completes the customer's constellation of Earth observation satellites capable of high definition video and imagery. Doing the lifting work was the star of the show of course the Falcon 9 booster designated B1049. This was the first booster to have flown for a sixth time having flown previously for Telstar 18 Vantage's mission in September 2018, Iridium 8 in January 2019 and the first, third and eighth Starlink missions. With another perfect launch and first stage separation the second stage continued on its way to deliver its payloads. Meanwhile the Falcon 9 booster was left to coast gracefully and it completed its re-entry burn followed by yet another beautiful landing on the drone ship of course I still love you. That was stationed around 630 kilometers downrange. The deck there not looking quite as clean as it has done in the past, quite similar I guess to just read the instructions. Just like we see with the reused boosters, the effort that goes into cleaning up the deck and repainting logos is probably just not worth the effort at this point with so many launches occurring. There's certainly a beauty to the chaos there. Personally I love seeing these dirty boosters on the pad. It gives us a real good sense of how this rapid reusability is changing the game as the technology evolves. So yes this was a record flight and not only was the launch successful but yet another 
wonderful landing. We hope to see B1049 taking another record seventh flight very soon. On top of that, the fairings which protect the payload while the rocket punches through the atmosphere in this mission flew previously on Starlink 4. And just check this out. Elon shared this stunning video here as the ship Miss Tree on autopilot caught one of the fairing halves while Miss Chief went fishing for its half. Amazing work there though as they keep improving the systems needed to consistently retrieve these fairings. The three rideshare satellites deployed gracefully as we see here, followed some 45 minutes later into the mission by a successful deployment of the Starlink satellites. And we also got to see just a little hint of those new visors deploying as well. Now speaking of Starlink, Ars Technica released an article around a week ago talking about some preliminary beta speed test results. It's important to realise of course that this is just early days and the network is still being deployed, but a number of testers have already been utilising the service and are reported to be getting download speeds between 11 and 60 megabits per second and upload speeds between 5 and 18 megabits per second. The latency tests are reported to have ranged between 31 to 94 milliseconds, with some even reporting ping times at the 20 to 21 millisecond mark reported just after the initial findings. Now seeing as the network is not yet fully rolled out, this is pretty impressive. If we compare to tweets from Elon Musk a little earlier in the year saying that around 20 milliseconds is the target being destined to run real-time competitive video games, it appears it is well on the way. What is interesting of course if you've been keeping up with the news around Starlink is that the Federal Communication Commission was certainly not convinced that Starlink would have the capability of delivering low latencies and was proposing limits on SpaceX's ability to to acquire funding for the Rural Broadband Program. Now the expectation to qualify for that was to provide latencies below 100 milliseconds, so it seems like the proof will be available very soon. It's also worth heading to the full article linked in the description to read further details about how these tests were obtained. As stated in the article, beta testers must sign non-disclosure agreements, so these speed tests might be one of the only glimpses we get of real world performance during these trials. Regardless, that glimpse is a very interesting thing to see at this very early stage. On top of all that, we have another Falcon 9 launch potentially next week with the Seocom 1B mission. This mission will launch into a sun-synchronous polar orbit and it also includes rideshare payloads. Another interesting point to this mission is that it is the first polar launch from the Florida Space Coast in 60 years as reported here by NASA Spaceflight. Also interesting little factoid, on that flight a Thor rocket stage impacted into Cuba reportedly killing a cow. Let's hope this mission leaves bovine populations free of destruction. So yes, this flight will have the booster returning to landing zone 1 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station rather than the more common drone ship landings. Because of that we of course tend to get even more beautiful clear footage of that booster landing from multiple angles, so really looking forward to that one. Now just the other day, Blue Origin dropped some super interesting new footage of the human landing system being constructed by the national team, made up of course by Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman and Draper. This here of course is a real life engineering mock-up of the crew lander vehicle that could take astronauts to the lunar surface. This is currently set up in the Space Vehicle Mock-up Facility at Johnson Space Center and it's actually a full scale engineering mock-up as well that show the two elements of the vehicle, the ascent element and the descent ascent element which when stacked on top of each other stands over 12 meters high. The ascent stage of course is what will launch astronauts off the moon surface to return and the descent stage carries the beast down to the lunar surface to touch down. That is of course Blue Origin's component to the project. The team will be continuing to test out the logistics and are aiming to fly the final system within several years. I certainly do hope to see that we get more regular updates as everything progresses here. Now Ariane Space's commercial launch complex recently completed another successful launch of the Ariane 5 heavy lift vehicle. This carried two telecommunication satellites into orbit as well as Northrop Grumman's mission extension vehicle number 2 designated MEV2. Now a little after 10pm we saw the main engine ignition. The super efficient cryogenic main stage there runs off liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and it puts out over 1390 kilonewtons of thrust in a vacuum and it's super efficient with a specific impulse of above 430 seconds. Then of course we have the two solid rocket boosters delivering a thrust of around 7,080 kilonewtons each. Now in terms of the maximum payload capability, it can place a little over 10 tons into a geostationary transfer orbit. In comparison, a Falcon 9 fully expended can I believe do close to 8.5 tons. Saying that, the Falcon 9 can put more into a low earth orbit if expended, so that goes to show the benefits of that cryogenic main stage. So following main engine cutoff 
off, we saw the stage separation with the first deployment several minutes later. Shortly after, MEV-2 was deployed, closely followed by separation of the dispenser system containing the BSAT-4B satellite, also deployed successfully. This triple payload was a first of its kind for Ariane 5. Now, the mission ahead for MEV-2 is interesting in itself. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but before that, a huge thank you to my sponsor, Brilliant. Without the incredible support here, there is no way that I could spend the time I do to put together this regular content for you. It's incredibly humbling to be able to reduce hours from other jobs to be able to focus more on this role. And the content and topics available from Brilliant suit this channel amazingly well. We talk about rocket launches, propulsion, and physics to a degree almost every week. But if you wanna go deeper and would like to learn something new, Brilliant is an excellent jumping off point. Content isn't just available from the website either. There is a great mobile app that will allow you to have fun with these topics on the move. What I really love about the material is the way the content is laid out. The goal here is problem solving and learning with interactive tasks that really let you visualize the why behind the math and the logic. For me, topics such as gravitational physics or the rocket equation are incredibly interesting and form a wonderful base knowledge for many of the topics that we talk about on this channel. For you, it may be something completely different. Just explore the many courses here until something spikes your interest. If you are naturally curious and you want to build up your knowledge on any of these topics, consider checking out Brilliant Premium. That would not only be a great thing for you, but it is also a wonderful way to support me here. To give it a try, just head to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people to follow the link will get 20% off that first year of Brilliant Premium. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, the mission extension vehicle on this launch is the second such satellite servicing vehicle designed to dock with a geostationary satellite. The fuel on that satellite is almost exhausted now and it's been in service since 2004. Docking is expected sometime in January 2021 and this process is intentionally slow for a very good reason. As we see here in a mission overview for MEV-2, after this servicing satellite is deployed, it raises its orbit slowly as does the target satellite. They both synchronize their orbit and rendezvous at a predefined graveyard orbit. That is an orbit that is essentially a few hundred kilometers above the operational orbit, just so that it isn't getting in the way of the satellites that are operational. After careful inspection of its host, a command will be sent for an autonomous approach to begin. Slow and steady wins the race here, and eventually the target satellite is captured and docked with. The satellite itself uses a liquid engine to tweak its orbit, and it is this engine nozzle that the MEV will latch onto. This docking is pure mechanical and therefore safer as there is no need for physical, electrical or data connections or risky fuel transfers. It is at this time that the host satellite that is currently near the end of service can have that life extended being repositioned by the mission extension vehicle's own thrusters. This station keeping exercise can be done as often as required before being returned to the graveyard orbit when its time is well and truly up. Once that mission is over, the MEV-2 vehicle can undock and move on to the next customer needing the service extension capability of this clever servicing satellite. Now there are a bunch of satellites every year that are retired due just to fuel depletion. And this is an ingenious way to revive them if only for another five years of useful service depending on the length of the customer servicing contract. Now I think it's also worth sharing some new footage just recently dropped here showing a 300 meter hop test of a prototype New Line Baby reusable rocket from a Link Space. The full New Line 1 vehicle is going to be a little larger than Rocket Lab's Electron, but aims to be greater than 75% reusable, putting payloads into low Earth orbit around 200 kilograms or so. It is of course targeting that small satellite market, so it'll be interesting to see how this little beast evolves as time goes by. A huge amount of excitement there as they nail that landing. Now just quickly, as always, a massive thank you to my amazing patrons here. I simply can't do what I'm doing here without all of you. Your generous support has allowed me to increase the time that I can spend on all of this content, and I can't thank everybody enough for that. Further help just allows me to do even more. If you like what I do and you'd like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included Discord roles. You can check out some exclusive patron-only content, and you can also have your name listed right here like all of these other incredible 
incredible people. A massive thank you as always to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in all of these topics and you'd like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about the upcoming Crew Dragon missions with Crew 1 at the end of October and Crew 2 next year. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTubers selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.